It's uh, good to be here, and uh, we trust that we all will be blessed as a result of this time spent around uh, the Word of God. Um, I wonder if we could uh, begin by reading from the book of Luke, Luke's Gospel, and uh, chapter number 9. It's Luke's Gospel, chapter number 9. Luke's Gospel, chapter number 9, and reading from verse number 26. And your Bible might have these words in red. These are words that were spoken by the Lord Jesus. And he says this, he says, For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and, my, and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. But I tell you of a truth, there shall be some standing here which shall not taste death till they see the kingdom of God. And it came to pass about eight days uh, after these sayings, he took Peter and James, uh, J John and James, and went up into a mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered, and his raiment was white and glistening. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spake of his decease which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. But Peter and they that were with him were heavy with sleep. And when they were awake, they saw his glory and the two men that stood with him. And it came to pass that when they departed from them, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he thus spake, there came a cloud and overshadowed them, and they feared as they entered into the cloud. And there came a voice out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, hear him. And when the voice was passed, Jesus was found alone. And they kept it close and told no man those things, any of those things which they had seen. Over to um, the book of uh, 2 Peter, uh, 2 Peter at chapter number 1. Second Peter, chapter number 1, and verse number 11. And Peter says, Peter was one of the people who was at this occasion we've just read about in, in, in uh, Luke's Gospel. For so an entrance will minister unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Therefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them and have been established in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet as long as I am in this tabernacle to stir you up, putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has shown me. Moreover, I will endeavour that you may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. For we've not followed cunningly devised fables when we've made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty, for he received from God the Father honour and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. And we have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well to take heed, as unto a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. And we know that God adds a blessing to these introductory uh, words uh, that we've read together from the Bible. The subject that I want to speak about tonight is the story, the, the incident of the transfiguration of the Lord Jesus Christ. The transfiguration is the story of, of Peter, James and John going up into the, the, a mountain with uh, the Lord Jesus um, and there something really strange happened, something remarkable. 
something that they had never seen before, something that their eyes had, had never seen. They had, they'd known Jesus now for some of them for, for, for decades possibly, but some of them, all of them for, for the best part of three years, they'd known him. They had seen him uh, lift up uh, little children and put them on his knee. They had seen him feed multitudes. They had seen him heal lepers. They had seen him bring the dead back to life. They had seen him deliver people who had been possessed by demons and, and make them in their right mind. They'd seen Jesus do lots of remarkable things. He had stayed, he had stilled storms and he had, um, and he had healed the multitudes. Until when they, and he had silenced his critics. They'd seen Jesus do some remarkable things, but they'd never seen him quite like this night. They'd never seen him quite un, like he did on this occasion. And what, what, what happens here is the story of the transfiguration of Christ, a, a transformation, a, a change in form that happened to him. Now, Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ was, and he is Jesus, he was a man. He literally was born of a virgin. He lived in uh, the, the, the village of Nazareth. He grew up in Capernaum. He, he ate, he slept, he grew tired, he was disappointed. He was, sometimes he, was, uh, he would have been tired as a result of uh, his activities. He was a man. He was a man, and, and if you had walked past Jesus in the, the street of Auchinleck today, that probably you wouldn't have given him a second glance because he was, he was an ordinary man. He was a man in all of his character. He was truly, absolutely man. And yet, for a brief period, up in this mount of what we're calling the transformation or transfiguration, something of his eternal deity... Something of his eternal and inherent glory and godlikeness was seen up in that mountain. And they knew him as a man, but for up in that mount of transfiguration, they saw him as much, much, much more than a man. They saw him and out of him sprung radiated glory, uncreated splendor of the divine person of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think it was Charles Spurgeon that says that this story that we've read about the transfiguration, the transfiguration is not a miracle. The transfiguration is a brief pause in a 33 and a half year miracle. The miracle is not that they looked on him in all of his glory. The miracle is that for 33 and a half years they looked on him in all of his humiliation, as he was in the form, who being in the very form of God, took upon himself the form of a servant and the frame of a man. And so we want to think a little bit about this story and we want to think um, some of the lessons, uh, lessons that we can learn and, and just to lift our eyes up and see him. So where does this take place? And it takes place uh, on, well, there's a bit of a dubiety, a bit of debate as to where this happens. If you were to go to Israel today on your holidays and you were to go on the, 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 the tour of the Holy Lands, they would take you to Mount Tabor. Someone said to me, the only reason that it's Mount Tabor is because there was plenty of room for a car park. Um, but that be, it has nevertheless been the traditional site of, of this occurrence uh, since about the third or fourth century. But that's largely been put into dispute for a number of reasons unknown to me, but one of which is the fact that at this time there's been excavations of a, mili a military fortress that was actually at the top of Mount Tabor. So it's unlikely, it makes it a less likely scene for um, this. The alternative is uh, Mount, Hebron, uh, Mount Hebron, rather, and perhaps uh, geologic, geographically where the story seems to have taken place, it would make sense that this took place in Mount Hermon. It's also uh, interesting that it's the only mountain in that place which actually is so high that it has, it has snowed, it's snow tapped uh, all year round. And so perhaps when we think of this one who was glistening like the snow, uh, then possibly um, uh, they were referring to the glory, uh, to the white uh, snow capped mountain uh, at the top of, of Mount Hermon. So it may be Mount Tabor, it may be Mount Hermon, but, but Peter tells us where it really was. Because Peter refers to us, he says, he tells us that we saw him in the holy mount. 
And whether it was Mount Tabor or whether it was Mount Hermon, the point is that it was the Holy Mount. And when they saw the Lord Jesus in all of, its, in all of his radiated glory, it became what it maybe never was. It became the Holy Mount. Just like that theophany that, the Lord, that, 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 when, that was revealed to Moses. Take off thy shoes. Take off your shoes from off your feet. For the ground whereon thou standest is holy ground. And that's the ground that we, we want to tread upon tonight. The same ground that Peter, James, John, Moses and Elijah tread upon. Mount Tabor, Mount Hermon. But take your pick. But we want tonight to tread with shoes, with feet unshod upon the holy ground of that brief moment of the re revelation of the effulgence of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it took place on a holy mountain. And when did it take place? Well, it took place towards the, uh, the end of, of the year 32 AD. It took place towards the end of the Lord Jesus' three and a half year ministry. Behind them, we've talked about some of the things that were in the past. Demon uh, deliverance from demon possession. The feeding of the 5,000 has just been a few chapters before in Mark's gospel. The feeding of the 4,000 has just been, I think, in the preceding chapter. Uh, there's been times when people have come from all the surrounding areas. He's been to the Jews. He's been to the Gentiles. He's uh, been to the rich. He's been to the poor. He's been to the, uh, the sinners and the, the Sadducees uh, and all of these folks. It's, it's coming to the end of, of, his, of his public ministry. So for three years or so, just under three years perhaps, individuals have followed the Lord, Lord Jesus. And all of that time, they still don't understand who he really is. They've been following him afar off. They've been maybe amused or bemused by his miracles, maybe challenged by his teaching, but they don't understand yet who the Lord Jesus really is. And now uh, is as where the, the Lord turns his face towards Calvary. It's not going to be any more about his um, synopsis of the kingdom, his teaching, his great teaching. It's not going to be any more uh, about the, the miracles. It's not going to be any more about the, uh, the training of these 12 apostles who will, who will take the gospel across the world. But he, for the first time, tells them, he says, he says, the Son of Man must go to Jerusalem and he must suffer at the hands of the scribes and the Pharisees and he will be, he will be put to death and rejected of the elders and the chief, priest, chief priests and the scribes and be slain and raised the third day. Now, there's a bombshell that they weren't expecting. They thought Jesus was going to come and rule. They thought that the, the Roman Empire was going to be rolled back. They thought that the Messiah was going to establish a kingdom here and now. And Jesus says to them, he says, well, actually, um, actually, I'm going to be rejected uh, and I'm going to be slain. And this is just after Peter has, has been given this revelation. Flesh and blood didn't reveal it to him, but God taught him that, um, that Christ was the son of the loving God. He said, who, who do men say that I am? And Peter was getting there. Uh, some said he was Elias. Some said he was John, the, John the, the, the Apostle John. Some said he was Jeremiah. Some said he was some other prophet. He said, but who do you say that I am? And, and Peter rises to this great height of, of spiritual insight. And he says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And so they're, they're growing in their knowledge of him. And yet only a moment later, Peter turns to him and says, Peter rebukes him and says, be it far from thee. He says, you're not, you're not going to Calvary. You're not going to Jerusalem. You're not going to die. You're, you're here. You're our conquering king. You know what Jesus said to him? Jesus said to him, he says, get behind me, Satan. You mind the things of this world and not the things of heaven. And so they're back down in the dump. So it took place in that, 30, uh, that 32nd year of the life of the Lord Jesus after a period of public miraculous ministry, after that revelation of the Messiahship of Christ, after the um, prediction of his death and burial and resurrection, and after uh, Peter was rebuked by the Lord. 
But the Bible, sometimes it appears that there are contradictions in the Bible. The Bible says that this happened on the sixth day on two occasions. And the one we've read in Luke's gospel says that it happened on the eighth day. Well, really it's just a matter of, of which day you start counting on. And I think that's the simple answer to that. Um, but on one of them, it speaks of being the sixth day. And in the Bible, new numbers are, are very important. And we look at numbers, they all mean things when we start to look at them. And number six would speak to us of the day of man. You say, well, how'd you get that? Well, what day was man created? Man was created on the sixth day. And so the sixth day is the day of man. And it was after the day of man that the Lord Jesus was revealed in his deity. It was after the day of, it was after his manhood had been fully expounded that these individuals, Peter, James, and John, had a revelation of his deity. It would be true to say that, if, that until we get beyond ourselves, our, our man, our, our own flesh, our own person, until we get beyond the sixth day and on into this number seven, speak to us of perfection. And so the sixth is all the failure of man. And yet up there on the mountain of transfiguration on that seventh day, they saw all of the perfections of the Lord Jesus Christ. But in another place, it tells us, the other two, it tell, here rather in Luke, it tells us that, and it came to pass that about eight days later, so what does eight mean? Well, eight is the, the number of new beginnings. The Jewish calendar, the Jewish week is in seven days, the same as ours, and there are seven days, in, and on the eighth day, it's the new beginning, it's the new week. It's the first day of a new week, it's that eighth day, and, and so the, the, they're going to see the the kingdom, the Lord Jesus Christ, they're going to see the, the kingdom of God coming in glory. And what do we know about the nature of the kingdom? He says, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. We look forward to the book of Revelation. It speaks about the things, uh, the things that, that will be in the eternal state. And it says, behold, I am making all things new. And so there is that newness, there is that freshness, there is that, um, there is that new hope, that new thing, that new kingdom. In fact, all things are new in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are a new creation. And so it began, it takes place on the eighth day. But why was it, where was it recorded? Well, we've read of it in Luke, but interestingly, it's recorded in three of the books of the Bible. It's only recorded, it's recorded in Matthew Mark and Luke. These are more the historical or otherwise known as the synoptic gospels. And it's recorded in the three of them. But strangely, Matthew wasn't invited. Mark got his information secondhand from Peter. Uh, Luke got his information secondhand. And John was actually there. And yet John is the only one who doesn't record for us the story of this transfiguration. It may be that such was the impact of the revelation of the Lord Jesus that it was things unlawful to be uttered. Something that he just could, something so sacred, so precious that he couldn't commit to paper. But I think what it is, is if you think about Matthew's gospel, Matthew's gospel explains for us, presents Jesus as the king, the king of the Jews. And yet he is ultimately, isn't he, a rejected king. He comes to his own and his own receive him not. Matthew is the story of the rejected king. Mark's gospel speaks to us of the perfect servant. The Lord Jesus is always active. He's always busy. He's always submitted to the will of the Father. He is the perfect servant. And so in, Mark, in Mark's gospel, we have the story of a perfect servant. And finally, in Luke's gospel, Luke's gospel describes him in his perfect humanity. And so Mark's gospel, Matthew, Mark, and Luke describe for us a rejected king, a suffering servant, a perfect servant, and a perfect man. But none of them truly reveal the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ in that sense. What you need, if you've got a rejected king, if you're hanging your hopes on a king who's come in rejection, who's hanging on a cross with a crown of thorns and not a crown of glory, who's came in the coat, the full of an ass, not a, not a victor's charger, 
And you want to hang, having described the one who is a rejected king. We see him, he's, great, he's far more than a rejected king. He is the king of kings and lord of lords. And he is the one who even now is reigning uh, in the kingdom of heaven. And so we have the perfect, uh, we have the, the rejected king, but he's the king of kings and lord of lords. We think of that one, he's the perfect servant. And yet ultimately when times get tough, when life is difficult, you don't want to be, you don't want to be relying, you don't want to be focusing on, on a perfect servant, but we think of one who is a perfect Lord. And that one who was, that one who, who washed their feet was the one who's, before whose feet they fell. And finally that perfect man, man with all of his failures, our own failures in mankind, and yet he is no, he is more than a perfect man. He is perfectly God. And so, uh, why does John not record it? Well, John's gospel begins, John's gospel begins um, by saying that, um, by saying, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. It finishes by saying, these things were written, why? That you might believe that he is the son of God, and that in believing these things, you might have life. John's gospel from beginning to end, from verse 1 to verse 28, I think it is of 30 of, verse 20, of, of chapter 20, from beginning to end declares the eternal deity, the sonship, the splendor, the glory of the Son of God and God the Son. And so that's why we have it recorded in Matthew, Mark and Luke, uh, but not recorded for us, <clears throat> but not recorded for us um, in, in, in the book uh, of John. So these three individuals who are brought here, and there's significance to that as well, because the three of them had seen things that no one else had seen. And we think of them, Peter, James, and John, they were there when there was the healing of Simon Peter's mother-in-law. And they saw the Lord Jesus as the great physician. They were there at the raising of Jairus' daughter, and they saw him as the resurrection and the life. And they were there at that transfiguration and they saw him as the glorious and beloved son. And just the three of them were present at the, the garden of Gethsemane as there they observed him prostrate on the ground as there he was the willing and submissive uh, sacrifice. These, four, these three men, or four, including a, a, Andrew on one occasion, had a vision of his miraculous power, a vision of his glorious presence and a vision of his magnanimous uh, and altruistic prayer on behalf uh, of, of the people as he would head, into, uh, Cal uh, head towards Calvary. They had a vision of his actions, a vision of his attributes, and a vision of his agonies. And it was only Peter, James, and John who were drawn into that inner circle. Those, these men who would be the pillars, and the pillars of, of the early church, the leaders of the church, and each of them is brought into that closeness for a real appreciation of who the Lord Jesus is. <clears throat> Peter. Peter's the one who had known what had the revelation of the, the Messiahship of Christ. You now Peter, he's rebuking the Lord. And so he needs to learn that. He, he understands it, that the Lord Jesus is the Messiah the Christ, the son of the living God, but yet he still has the audacity to rebuke him. And Peter has to learn the reality of who the Lord Jesus is. Peter's going to be martyred about AD 67 or 68. He's going to be put to death. He's going to die having nursed the, the early church for 30 odd years as one of their main leaders. Uh, and at the end of that time, he's going to He's going to be crucified. And if history has it right, he's going to be crucified upside down, head down. He's going to have gone through a long period of, of persecution, a long period of brutal tribulation. And at the end of it, what does he, what's he hanging on to? What has kept this, this leader, this pillar of the church, what has kept him going? What has kept him going? How has he been able to shepherd a flock? How in the midst of the, the diaspora and the spreading and, and the persecution, first in Jerusalem and, and then in Rome and wherever they go, there are hated people. And the, the, lead, the people of, of the church will no doubt be coming to Peter and saying, surely we must have got this wrong. 
Surely we must, have, we must be following the wrong way. We must have something wrong. And Peter, after 30 odd years of persecution and tribulation, he says, look, I'm not going to be negligent to put you in remembrance of these things. Remember them. I established you in this present truth. As long as I'm alive, I'm going to stir you up and I'm going to put you in remembrance. Because he says, I'm an old man now. And I'm going to put off my tabernacle. I'm going to die. My my body is is, is becoming decrepit and dying. And he says, just as Jesus showed me, he says in in 2 Peter 1, he says, I endeavor that you might, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. And Peter says to him, look, we're not following cunningly devised fables. We're not just another cult. We're just not just another group of religious zealots. We're not making this up. He says, we're not following cunningly devised fables. When we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's people and they've been waiting now for, um, for what, 30 odd years of persecution and trial and, and death and, and dispersal. Uh, and surely they're thinking, have we got this wrong? And Peter, the leader of the early church, says, we are not following cunningly devised fables because I was an eyewitness of his majesty. I saw it. It doesn't look like it now in all of the darkness, but I saw it. I was an eyewitness of his majesty. I've seen him. I've seen him in the brightness of the glory. I've seen his glory filling the mountain, his face shining like the sun. I've seen him. Jesus is different. The kingdom is coming. His rule is certain. His victory is already achieved. I've seen it because there came that he received from his father, your rejected savior. I saw him receive honor and glory when there came such a voice from the excellent glory. This, who is he? Who is this one they've been following through tribulation and persecution? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven, we heard. Peter says, I heard it. Heard it with my own ears. I have heard him. And when when I was with him on that holy mount, and 30 odd years later, he hears the voice of God commending his son. And so he says, so we've got a more sure word of prophecy. And you do well to take heed as unto the light the light of the Lord Jesus that shines even in this dark place, a dark place of persecution and tribulation until the hope of a day dawning and that day star, that morning star arises in your hearts. That morning star rose on the spiritual, uh, the spiritual horizon of Peter and he never lost the vision of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he says, we have a more sure word of prophecy. You do well to take heed. There's a light that shines even in this dark place until the day dawn, the hope of the end of the period of of, of persecution and the day star, the shining light of Jesus shines in your heart. And that's why Peter, that's why Peter had to see that. But what about James? Why did James have to be there? Well, James was, the, James was uh, the brother of John. Uh, he had given up everything. He was a wealthy family. They were fishers. They owned multiple boats. And they left it all. Uh, and James' life is snuffed out only, I think, months into the early church. He dies. Uh, and after just, a, after just a few short months of the beginning of the church, James is imprisoned and finally he's martyred and what's James thinking to himself as he's sitting there in that um, in that dungeon awaiting Herod's executioner he's thinking of the, the, the he's thinking of that vision that he had of the Lord Jesus he's aware because he heard Jesus teach him verily verily truly I say to you He who has, there is no man who's left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake in the Gospels, but he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time 
houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the world to come, eternal life. It says, many that are first shall be last. Now, James wanted to be first in the kingdom. James wanted to be the one who sat, James and John, sitting on either side of the Lord Jesus when he came to reign. And he was asked whether he was able to bear it. And they thought they could. And so the need for the suffering before, uh, before, the crown, uh, before the crown. And so they knew James, that son of thunder, that one who desired to sit at the right hand of God. He said, are you, are you able? Are you able to sit with me in my kingdom? And the price of the kingdom for James was the price of his martyrdom. And finally, then John. What was John doing there? And John was also the same brother, but I'm thinking of the fact that John was the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now we know that the Lord Jesus had a particularly fond relationship with, with John. Spoke speaks of him as the disciple whom Jesus loved. He was the one who knew what it was to lie on the breast of the Lord Jesus, to recline on the physical breast of the Lord Jesus. He knew what it was to hear the heartbeat of the divine, to speak to him, to converse with him, to, to literally just to know him in such an intimate way, in such a deep friendship and, and love that he was the disciple that Jesus loved. And we know that, that Jesus' love is so wonderful for all of us, but, but to single out John for that position of, or of closeness. And I'm just wondering, what was it like for him to no longer be able? He was then exiled in Patmos. He became a very old man. And the memory of Jesus' voice would have become, have become a distant memory. And the sound of his heartbeat was something that he could only, he could only vaguely recall. That one who had known such personal intimacy and joy and friendship with the Lord Jesus. And yet he's exiled, not just without Christ, but without anyone. He's on an island called Patmos. He's, he's in exile. He's, he's a very, very old man. And what does he write? He writes, that which was from the beginning, that which we heard, he says, I heard him. And we have seen him with our eyes. And we have looked upon him. That's not just seen him. Lots of people see Jesus. But I gazed upon him. He knew something of what it was like to, to just, you know, like you've got a baby in your arms and you can just watch them all day. Just imagine the closeness of the relationship that John had. I didn't just see Jesus, but I gazed upon him. And not only did I gaze upon him, but I handled him. I touched him. The word of life. Because that life was shown forth and manifested. And we've seen it and I'm bearing witness of it. That which was of the Father and that which was manifested to us. And John says, that which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you so that you can have fellowship with us. See, that fellowship had never left him. That fellowship, that love in his heart, that, relation, that love relationship with Jesus had never ended. He says that you might have fellowship with us and our fellowship. He says this fellowship has been broken for years, decades since he last saw the physical form of Christ. And yet he says that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, our fellowship is now with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And he says, so we're not sorrowing. We write these things to you that your joy may be full. He's not heartbroken over the loss of a friend because he's still in full fellowship with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And so that's perhaps some reasons as to why we have Peter, James, and John there. So we're learning, it says that there's going to be some people who are going to be alive when Jesus comes it says there are going to be some people standing here, verse 27 of Luke 9, which will not see death till they see the kingdom of God. Now we see not, you and I, we don't see the kingdom of God. 
the lion lying down with the lamb, the child playing by the serpent's den, the plowshares being turned, sorry, the spears being, swords being turned into agricultural equipment. We don't see that. We don't see, we see not yet all things put under him. Uh, but to we, it hasn't happened yet. The physical kingdom of Christ reigning on earth, that will happen. A thousand years reign of Christ. But the can, but it says, they will not see, taste death until they see the kingdom of God. So are they still alive? No, they're all dead. So when did they see the kingdom of God? When did they see the sovereign rule of Christ in action? They saw him in this Mount of Transfiguration. There they saw that he was the one who was before all things, above all things, the one who created all things and keeps on sustaining all things by the word of his power. When he, by him were all things created, for him were all things created, without him was not anything made that was made. And there that was revealed to them. What can we learn about the character of this kingdom? It is a heavenly kingdom rather than only an earthly kingdom. It is a spiritual kingdom rather than a physical kingdom. And it is hidden currently to those who are outside, but it is going to be manifested, shown forth in the future. Jesus was still in charge. Even when they slapped his face and whipped his back, the Lord Jesus was still reigning in sovereign authority over all of the kingdoms of the earth. It's missed by those who are asleep. We read that. It's the kingdom. Whose kingdom is it? It is the kingdom of the Son. It is a kingdom of glory and grandeur. A kingdom of righteousness and holiness. It is a new kingdom that replaces an old covenant. But it is not yet. It is not yet. The kingdom is not yet in physical form here on this earth. Hebrews chapter number 2 tells us that. He says, all things, thou hast put all things in subjection of the rule of his feet. For in that he put all things, all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But we see not yet all things under him. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honour. Jesus is crowned with glory and honour that because, and what is that, that means of that was that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Jesus, the crown of Jesus' glory was for him a crown of thorns before a crown uh, of glory. And, and so we think of that kingdom. The kingdom is ultimately encapsulated in Christ. Christ, there's coming a day when everything will be wiped away. There'll be a great day of account. All the dross will be gone, will be judged righteously. And everything that will continue into the eternal state will be Christ. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ, the revelation of the eternal God. A, a world that is... Uh, a world that is um, sustained by his power and illuminated by his light. He is its object, its adoration, its center, its circumference. The kingdom of God is the kingdom of the glorious Christ. But let's just think for a moment or two uh, before we finish. Of something of the um, something of the person of the Lord Jesus as we see him in these um, pictures. We see him, it says, it came to pass about eight days later, he went into a mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered and his raiment was white and glistering. I want, and I'm not going to be able to do it. Learn that tonight on the way up here. We can't do it. We can't, I can't explain to you what Jesus looked like on that day or that night. I just can't. I actually sat on my road up here tonight 
Uh, and I kept trying to look at the sun and I couldn't look at it. I, kept, I looked at the sun and, and all it did was, 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 was blind me. I couldn't look directly on the setting sun. It, it just filled about a, a third of the, the sky and, and I, I just couldn't, I couldn't look on it. It was so bright. It was, it was unapproachable. It would damage my eyes. I, we just can't look on him in all of his glory. That's why for you and I, we are creatures of the dust and of the earth. Uh, and so we, even Peter, James, and John, these men who knew the Lord Jesus, Moses and, and Elijah, representatives of the law and the prophets, they, they, when there was the glory of the Shekinah, revelation of the outshining of Jesus' glory, there came a, a cloud that overshadowed it. We can't look on it. Moses said, show me your glory. And God says, I'll put my hand there and I'll pass by and you'll see my back part. You won't see my glory. You can't. It's too big. It's too great. It's, it's, too, it's too radiant. The inherent glory of Jesus. But you know what happened as I sat on the, the road just um, along to, along to Ogletree? As I'd driven from, from Cross House up here, as I was driving, the, the sun was setting. And even as I, I sat and, and prayed and, and thought about the meeting tonight, the sun began to set behind the clouds. And... There came then a, a soft glow of that incalculably powerful glowing orb that is our sun. And veiled as it dropped below the horizon, it left behind um, just a soft but pleasant and impressive sunset. And as I looked to this side, I saw that as the sun had set, and there, there my heart thrilled with the beauty of another sunset that God has painted upon that canopy again. I looked to over here, and I saw a moon. And the moon has no inherent radiance. The moon has no extracto. The moon is not an elampo. It does not... It does not radiate. It does not beam. But it reflects. It reflects that which it absorbs from the sun. It becomes the one that rules the night. It pales into insignificance in the presence of the sun who rules the day. And you and I, we live in the dark night of, of human endurance and experience. And you and I, we can't, with our frail minds, our spiritual insight, we can't gaze upon Jesus Christ in all of his glory. One day we will, we will see him, and we will be like him for, we shall see him as he is. But now, we are being transformed from glory unto glory. Now it is our responsibility not as to be a luminary, but to be a reflection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Peter, James and John went on to reflect something of what they had seen. Our eyes have seen. Our hands have handled of the word of life. And Peter was determined that they would pass on what he had learned. He was determined that he would be like him. He was transformed. He became of another kind. He was metamorphosed before them. He didn't change in form, but he revealed what he always was. For that brief period, they looked on him and they saw him in all of his glory. They saw that Jesus was completely different, even from what they had ever expected. Beyond their wildest imaginations, they saw him in all of his loveliness. But you know what? It says that. And Peter and they that were with him, 
were heavy with sleep. And I wonder, is there the possibility that even on the Mount of Transformation and Transfiguration, there's maybe a number of reasons that we don't see him shining in all of his glory. I was thinking about sometimes we go for, sometimes you, you're out in the morning and, and you, I look up in the morning and there's no stars. There's no stars. And there's a number, I'm going to think of three reasons why there's, why there's no stars in the morning, why I don't see any stars in the morning. First is, sometimes it's not dark enough. And they are, their luminescence uh, pales into insignificance compared with the sun that's risen. So perhaps we don't see the Lord Jesus Christ because the circumstances of our life are not dark enough to cause us uh, to, to turn our eyes to him. And sometimes the darkness is where we see. And then we come out at midnight uh, and you see the whole earth, the whole of the, the heavens, the whole earth declares the glory of the Lord. And so sometimes we don't see the glistening stars, starlight, because... It's not dark enough. Sometimes it's because there are clouds between. Sometimes you don't see the stars because there are, there are clouds. There are barriers to your vision of Jesus and mine. And there is sin in our life and there is things that cause us not to see him in all of his fullness. If now with eyes defiled and dim, we see these signs but see not him, oh may his love, the, the, the scales displace and bid us see him face to face. And sometimes we don't see him because of that. And sometimes we don't see him because we don't take the time to look up. Sometimes we don't take the time to look up. And you know, they, Peter, James and John, were invited to ascend this mountain to pray. And it was as he prayed that his countenance was changed. And I think if we want a, a real appreciation of we want to see the Lord Jesus in all of his glory, then we'll need to be looking up. We'll need to be seeking him. We'll need to be looking off unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And so I would encourage us to look up, make time, come away to an elevated place and spend time with him. And when we spend time with him, then we will see him. And lastly, these men, they didn't see him because they were asleep. I wonder whether they were just bored. They just didn't realize who they were, where they were, or who they were with. I wonder, does Jesus bore you? Does the Lord Jesus Christ bore you? Does, does Christianity, your Christian life, is it boring? The problem is not, the, pro, the problem is, is, it's not with Jesus. The problem is that these folk were heavy with sleep. And when they wakened out of sleep, when they were startled from sleep, they saw his glory so awake if you sleep and see him and when at the end of it, it says this is my beloved son hear him and when the cloud passes it says they found Jesus alone only Jesus up that mountain they came down what, what, was, the, what was the thing that encapsulated their attention they saw no man <coughs> save Jesus Although maybe we have seen something of him as we've tread on this holy mountain tonight, that we might see him, we might know him, we might love him, and that we may be transformed from glory unto glory, and that we may be like him when we see him as he is. Shall we pray? Our Father, as we come into thy presence tonight, we pray that we would have been able to just reflect something of that which we are so incapable of seeing and explaining and expounding ourselves. But Lord, we thank thee for the Lord Jesus. We thank thee for his glory, his majesty, his inherent character, his glistening nature, his visage shining like the sun. And Father, we pray that, that we would have just seen him a little bit more clearly, that we would have just been drawn in our hearts of love towards him and that we may ascend that mount of transfiguration and elevation and see him and see him alone. Lord, you know the hearts of each one of us who are here, you know where we are in our walk with you. And Lord, we really pray that everyone who's here would have been blessed as a result of just searching the scriptures, for those are they which speak of him. And Father, we may see him, uh, and that we may 
um, really be transformed by a vision of our Saviour. So we ask these things, just praying uh, for your blessing on us as we give thanks. In his precious name, amen.